death. Death is all around us. We live in a world where death seems to have the upper hand. Everything and everyone dies. Just earlier today, I was at the funeral of my last remaining grandparent. That's a reminder again that the inevitable always comes to us. We will eventually die. You will die, and everyone that you know will die. And not just people too. Animals, plants, trees, everything that is alive comes to an end. So death seems to always win. Leaves fall off a tree, and then leaves come back later on. But it's not the same leaves. Those leaves are dead. People die, and then people are born. But the ones who died don't come back, and the ones who are born are born to die. So even the cycle that we have with autumn and winter and spring and summer, still the life that was lost seems to never come back. Death prevails and life is always destroyed. Death seems to be the victor. Now, if things are what they seem and death really is the ultimate victor, then there cannot be a God. How can there be an almighty creator if his own creation loses and succumbs to the abyss? The fact is, if there is no resurrection of the dead, there is no God. There might be some sort of creator, but he's not the God that we as Christians understand. He's not almighty. Even if we go to heaven when we die and live there forever, that still means that on earth, death always wins. And some Christians, unfortunately, have this mistaken mindset that when we die, we go to heaven and we never come back. We never come back to earth and earth eventually will get destroyed. And that's that. That means that there was a little piece in God's universe where death prevailed there. God gets to have his heaven but earth he loses. And if there's even just a little piece of this universe where God isn't supreme, then he isn't God because he isn't almighty. He cannot therefore be trusted to prevail over anything. If he can't even keep his own creation together and alive, if it loses, if it dies, then he's actually beholden to death himself. He can't create anything that lasts. And then that seemingly means that he must die eventually too. If there's no resurrection, there cannot be a God. Or not any God that we can recognize anyway. And certainly not any God that we can put our trust and hope in. If there's no God, and if there's nothing after we die, then what's the point? If there's no God, and nothing after death, then for starters, there cannot be any justice this has long been recognized by philosophers, even Kant recognized this. Because in this life, it's pretty clear that the wicked don't always get what they deserve in this life. Some of the richest people in the world are certainly not people who we would want to call righteous. And some of the most righteous people that we know live in poverty and got betrayed, and they never really got justice so if there's no resurrection, if there's nothing after we die, there's no justice. And therefore, there's no right or wrong. And if there's no right or wrong, there's no purpose. There's no meaning to life. It eventually just becomes, as Nietzsche saw it, it's all about power. Whoever has the most power wins. Might is right. That's the only thing left. And also, if there's no afterlife, if there's nothing after we die, then nothing you do here actually matters. Your children might be a big part of, of your life and your legacy. Well, they're going to die too. Maybe you set up a wonderful company or you set up a church even. Eventually, that's going to die too. There's no meaning ultimately. 
If the universe will eventually just blow up or implode, there's nothing. There's no one who will ever remember anything that you did. Now, people tell us Christians that we believe in fairy tales. I'm sure you've all heard this. But I would say that it's not us who believe in fairy tales. It's those who do not believe in God. The fairy tale is saying that you can create your own meaning, your own purpose. That is quite literally a fairy tale. It's made up. If you think there is no ultimate objective purpose to life, but you get to make your own purpose, that's just a story you tell yourself. And that story will die when you die. So no, if there is no God, there is no meaning. And if there's no resurrection, there's no God. How can God rule over the universe and tell us what's right and wrong if he can't even keep his creation alive? And therefore, we are slaves to death. Death is the ultimate winner. So, that's a daunting, daunting thing to consider. And if it's the case that when, before we were born, we didn't exist, and then we're born and we live, and then we go back to the abyss, well, that means that life ultimately is just a cruel joke. You get brought into the world only to find out what it's like to die and go back to nothing. Now, if this is the case, then you know what? We may as well indulge our sinful desires. We may as well live it up, party every night, do what we want. If you've got power, abuse it to your heart's content. Who cares? They're all going to be dead anyway. And if you think this sounds a bit crazy, like I'm going off the track here, guess what? This actually isn't me saying this. This is St. Paul saying this. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Scripture, therefore, itself, God himself, actually makes this claim. The Bible makes this claim. It's a very bold claim the Bible makes, but this is what it makes. The Bible in 1 Corinthians 15 says, If there is no resurrection, then, quote, your faith is useless, and you're still in your sins. And then St. Paul says, and therefore, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the Bible saying this. It's not me. And, of course, in our culture today, in contemporary New Zealand, that is how most young people today live. And while we mourn that, you in a sense, they're just sort of being logically consistent with their worldview. But of course, even if we were to indulge our baser desires, it wouldn't really give us lasting happiness, as we all probably know. And it certainly wouldn't stop us from dying. Now, people sometimes act like suffering is a problem for Christianity. The fact that there is suffering in the world is a, is a big problem. Maybe even the problem. How can there be a God if there's suffering? As if we Christians have never considered the existence of suffering before. But of course, Christians, I would say more than anyone, are well aware that there's suffering. The symbol of our religion, of course, being a torture device where our God was crucified and killed. And the New Testament is filled with teachings about how we should expect suffering in this life. The Christian life isn't about avoiding suffering, it's actually about embracing suffering and finding redemption in it. Now, imagine the apostles of Jesus Christ on Easter Saturday or early in the morning on Easter Sunday. Try and be in their shoes. They have just witnessed who they thought was the Messiah be killed by the Romans. Now, remember, for the Jews at this time, they were expecting a Messiah, and they were expecting a Messiah to be a political leader who would overthrow the Roman Empire, who, of course, had been mistreating the Jews for a very long time and had occupied the Holy Land, the Promised Land. They thought Jesus was going to be this Messiah to get rid of the Romans, restore sovereignty to Israel. But then he was crucified by the Romans, the most shameful death imaginable and the most painful death imaginable. So what? Was Jesus actually a fraud? 
Was he a false messiah? And then they saw Jesus be entombed, and the stone was rolled over the tomb. And it seems that their own hopes and dreams were entombed with him. In Luke chapter 24, some disciples are walking away from Jerusalem towards Emmaus, and they say, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. We were hoping, as in they don't hope that anymore. He died. He lost. This whole thing was for nothing. Now, they'd been, before Jesus and after Jesus, other men who had claimed to be the Messiah, and they had also, some of them, died. And their movement died with them, just died with them. During the wars between the Jews and Rome, many of the zealots, the Jewish uh, insurgents who were fighting against Rome, they actually committed mass suicide, uh, hundreds of them, at a place you can visit today in, in Masada in Israel. That's what happens when your hopes die. They really thought Jesus Christ was the one to do it. And if he's died, well, you know what? If, if that was what they pinned everything in, if, if all their eggs were in this basket, if they'd left their whole lives behind to follow Jesus, only to see him be crucified, you have to wonder if maybe they thought maybe there isn't a God either. Maybe Judaism itself is all false. Maybe the Romans have it right. Maybe you know, polytheism is the right way. Or maybe there isn't a God. We often think that the ancient people didn't sort of have the mental capacity to even consider atheism an option. That's actually not true. They were atheists. They've always been atheists. So maybe they were doubting God as well. Now, it's in this context that Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' followers, she goes to the tomb early in the morning while it's still dark, like it is right now. Now, it says that when she got there, the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. She then runs straight back to the disciples. She tells Peter and John, that's the disciple whom Jesus loved, that someone had taken Jesus' body. That's the natural thing to think. She's not expecting him to rise from the dead. Someone's stolen his body. Peter and John then run. They sprint to the tomb. We have this, uh, this sort of thing here where, where John outruns Peter. He comes to the tomb first. Now, John, he's a teenager. He's probably about 18 years old. And I, I think there's a lot of realism and sort of vividness about this. John outruns Peter. He's the younger man. He gets to the tomb first, and then he stops. He can't go in. It's, it's still dark out. It's a tomb. Also, of course, uh, dead bodies are unclean in Judaism. He doesn't want to uh, do anything that he isn't supposed to do. He doesn't go in. And I think that's very realistic. He doesn't know what to do. He stops outside the tomb. Peter catches up to him. Peter goes straight into the tomb. Classic Peter always, gun ho. He stoops in and he, he looks inside the tomb and he sees the linen cloths lying there and the cloth that would have been over our Lord's face folded neatly. Now that's just weird, right? So someone stole his body, but took off his clothes and folded them nicely. There's a, this, is, this is surreal, this is very strange. And of course, again, Jews wouldn't come into contact with a dead body, so seemingly a Jew didn't do this, and then maybe a Roman did it, but why would they do it? There's, there's all kinds of questions going through their minds. And then they, I don't know what they did next, but they, they went back. <laughs> they went back home. I mean, what else are you going to do? They're not expecting him to come back. All right, he's gone. There's no one around. Yes, we better just go home. <laughs> and we'll, we'll come back in the morning and see what happens. There's so much vividness and <clears throat> humanity and realism in this account. There certainly isn't... Uh, reading to me like a myth or a fairy tale. Even some people who call themselves Christians, they, some of them believe that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and that the resurrection account is all mythology or it's a metaphor for how love prevails over hate or some nonsense like that. But if, if you're going to be writing a myth to have some metaphorical meaning, I don't know why you'd have all these intricate little realistic details in there. Then they leave. Now Mary, she stands outside the tomb weeping. 
Of course, throughout this whole Passion period, it's interesting how the, the male disciples are the ones who sort of uh, deny Christ and seemingly only one of them, John, is there for the crucifixion. They all sort of leave, but the women actually stand firm. The women hold on. And Mary, she's, she's still there. She's outside the tomb weeping. Weeping because she's still traumatized by what's happened, but now, just to add insult to injury, his body's been stolen. And then she sees two angels in white sitting inside the tomb. Seemingly, she didn't really realize they were angels. One at the head and the other at the feet where Jesus' body had been laying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. This happens in the resurrection accounts. People don't immediately recognize Jesus. That might be because his body is transformed in some way now that it's been immortalized. Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she recognized him immediately. Jesus is alive. And ladies and gentlemen, that statement is as true now as it was then. Because Jesus wasn't just resuscitated. He didn't come back just to die again, like what happened with Lazarus and the other people whom he he resurrected or really resuscitated, they would go on to die again. No, 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 he has died to death. He has been made immortal. He will never die again, and there is no more death in his body. There is no more decay. There is no more aging. There is no more suffering in his body. It's immortal, which is an amazing thing to wrap your head around, the idea of a, of a live body that's actually immortal. Jesus has defeated death. God is the victor, not death. And therefore, the most powerful force in this whole world has been defeated. Jesus, the Messiah, has risen to immortality. And you know what that means? That means that God is real. This isn't just some story. This really happened. God is real. And it was that faith, the apostles, what they had seen and heard, they saw Jesus rise from the dead, they touched him with their own hands. It was because of that experience, the fact that they had seen death be destroyed, be defeated, and therefore they became utterly convinced that God really is real, that they would go on to suffer and die for this. If they had colluded with each other to make up some story that Jesus really was resurrected, you wouldn't have expected 11 of the 12 of the apostles to be tortured and murdered for their faith. And St. Paul, who didn't see Jesus resurrected at this time, he saw Jesus later, he, he changed his whole worldview. He was a Pharisee who persecuted the church, and he became a Christian. And he also was tortured and imprisoned and suffered and eventually was killed for this faith. They really believed in this, and we really believe in it, because we have experienced Jesus Christ as well, risen, the risen Christ. The apostles died knowing that there is meaning to life. And they died knowing that there is a reward after this life. Because if Jesus Christ was raised, so will all those who believe in him. Jesus says in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. Because Jesus has defeated death, he's defeated it for us, and he allows us to pass into immortality as well. And when he returns, all those who belong to him will be raised to immortal life here on this earth when heaven and earth become one. So while it seems that death is the victor, no, Christ is the victor. Christ has defeated death, and the day shall come when all those who believe in him will rise again and worship him for all eternity, and death will be no more. 
God is able to do this because just as he said, let there be light, and there was light, so also he can say, rise up, and so we shall. And why do we trust in this? Why do we trust that we will be risen to immortal life? Because Jesus is risen. He is the guarantee that this will happen. And just as it's guaranteed, Jesus really did rise from the dead. Well, Jesus also says, if you believe in me, I will raise you to immortal life. And that is a promise he makes to all of you tonight. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will raise you to immortal life. And you might think, well, I don't deserve this. Of course you don't deserve it, which is why he died for your sins. He came to save sinners like us, and just by trusting in Jesus Christ and in his resurrection, we will be raised with him. And so if Jesus is alive, then God is real. Amen. Amen.